Welcome to a fireside reading of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, chapter 55, part two. I could not eat. I could not sit still. I could not continue steadfast to anything. Something within me, faintly answering to the storm without, tossed up the depths of my memory and made a tumult in them. Yet in all the hurry of my thoughts, wild running with the thundering sea, the storm and my uneasiness regarding Ham were always in the foreground. My dinner went away almost untasted, and I tried to refresh myself with a glass or two of wine in vain. I fell into a dull slumber before the fire without losing my consciousness, either of the uproar out of doors or of the place in which I was. Both became overshadowed by a new and indefinable horror. And when I awoke, or rather, when I shook off the lethargy that bound me in my chair, my whole frame thrilled with objectless and unintelligible fear. I walked to and fro, tried to read an old gazetteer, listened to the awful noises, looked at faces, scenes and figures in the fire. At length, the steady ticking of the undisturbed clock on the wall tormented me to that degree that I resolved to go to bed. It was reassuring on such a night to be told that some of the inn servants had agreed together to sit up until morning. I went to bed exceedingly weary and heavy, but on my lying down, all such sensations vanished as if by magic, and I was broad awake with every sense refined. For hours I lay there, listening to the wind and water, imagining now that I heard shrieks out at sea, now that I distinctly heard the firing of signal guns, and now the fall of houses in the town. I got up several times and looked out, but could see nothing except the reflection in the window panes of the faint candle I had left burning and of my own haggard face looking in at me from the black void. At length my restlessness attained to such a pitch that I hurried on my clothes and went downstairs. In the large kitchen, where I dimly saw bacon and ropes of onions hanging from the beams, the watchers were clustered together in various attitudes about a table purposely moved away from the great chimney and brought near the door. A pretty girl who had her ears stopped with her apron and her eyes upon the door screamed when I appeared, supposing me to be a spirit. But the others had more presence of mind and were glad of an addition to their company. One man, referring to the topic they had been discussing, asked me whether I thought the souls of the collier crews who had gone down were out in the storm. I remained there, I dare say, two hours. Once I opened the yard gate and looked into the empty street. The sand, the seaweed, and the flakes of foam were driving by and I was obliged to call for assistance before I could shut the gate again and make it fast against the wind. There was a dark gloom in my solitary chamber when I at length returned to it. But I was tired now, and getting into bed again, fell off a tower and down a precipice into the depths of sleep. I have an impression that for a long time, though I dreamed of being elsewhere and in a variety of scenes, it was always blowing in my dream. At length, I lost that feeble hold upon reality and was engaged with two dear friends, but who they were, I don't know, at the siege of some town in a roar of cannonading. 
The thunder of the cannon was so loud and incessant that I could not hear something I much desired to hear until I made a great exertion and awoke. It was broad day, eight or nine o'clock, the storm raging in lieu of the batteries and someone knocking and calling at my door. What is the matter? I cried. A wreck! Close by! I sprung out of bed and asked, What wreck? A schooner from Spain or Portugal, laden with fruit and wine. Make haste, sir, if you want to see her. It's thought down on the beach she'll go to pieces every moment. The excited voice went clamouring along the staircase, and I wrapped myself in my clothes as quickly as I could and ran into the street. Numbers of people were there before me, all running in one direction to the beach. I ran the same way, outstripping a good many, and soon came facing the wild sea. The wind might by this time have lulled a little, though not more sensibly than if the cannonading I had dreamed of had been diminished by the silencing of half a dozen guns out of hundreds. But the sea having upon it the additional agitation of the whole night, was infinitely more terrific than when I had last seen it. Every appearance it had then presented bore the expression of being swelled, and the height to which the breakers rose and, looking over one another, bore one another down and rolled in in interminable hosts was most appalling. In the difficulty of hearing anything but wind and waves, and in the crowd, and the unspeakable confusion, and my first breathless efforts to stand against the weather, I was so confused that I looked out to sea for the wreck and saw nothing but the foaming heads of the great waves. A half-dressed boatman standing next me pointed with his bare arm, a tattooed arrow on it pointing in the same direction. To the left. Then, oh great heaven, I saw it close in upon us. One mast was broken, short off six or eight feet from the deck, and lay over the side, entangled in a maze of sail and rigging, and all that ruin as the ship rolled and beat, which she did without a moment's pause and with a violence quite inconceivable, beat the side as if it would stave it in. Some efforts were even then being made to cut this portion of the wreck away, for as the ship, which was broadside on, turned towards us in her rolling, I plainly descried her people at work with axes, especially one active figure with long, curling hair, conspicuous among the rest. But a great cry, which was audible even above the wind and water, rose from the shore at this moment. The sea, sweeping over the rolling wreck, made a clean breach and carried men, spars, casks, planks, bulwarks, heaps of such toys into the boiling surge. The second mast was yet standing with the rags of a rent sail and a wild confusion of broken cordage flapping to and fro. The ship had struck once, the same boatman hoarsely said in my ear, and then lifted in and struck again. I understood him to add that she was parting amidships, and I could readily suppose so, for the rolling and beating were too tremendous for any human work to suffer long. As he spoke, there was another great cry of pity from the beach. Four men arose with the wreck out of the deep, clinging to the rigging of the remaining mast, uppermost the active figure with the curling hair. There was a bell on board, and as the ship rolled and dashed like a desperate creature driven mad, now showing us the whole sweep of her deck, as she turned on her beam ends towards the shore, now nothing but her keel, 
as she sprung wildly over and turned towards the sea, the bell rang, and its sound, the knell of those unhappy men, was borne towards us on the wind. Again we lost her, and again she rose. Two men were gone. The agony on the shore increased. Men groaned and clasped their hands. Women shrieked and turned away their faces. Some ran wildly up and down along the beach, crying for help where no help could be. I found myself one of these, frantically imploring a knot of sailors whom I knew not to let those two lost creatures perish before our eyes. They were making out to me in an agitated way, I don't know how, for the little I could hear I was scarcely composed enough to understand, that the lifeboat had been bravely manned an hour ago and could do nothing, and that, as no man would be so desperate as to attempt to wade off with a rope and establish a communication with the shore, there was nothing left to try. When I noticed that some new sensation moved the people on the beach and saw them part and ham came breaking through them to the front i ran to him as well as i know to repeat my appeal for help but distracted though i was by a sight so new to me and terrible the determination in his face and his look out to sea exactly the same look as I remembered in connection with the morning after Emily's flight, awoke me to a knowledge of his danger. I held him back with both arms and implored the men with whom I'd been speaking not to listen to him, not to do murder, not to let him stir from off that sand. Another cry arose on shore, and looking at the wreck, we saw the cruel sail, with blow on blow, beat off the lower of the two men and fly up in triumph round the active figure left alone upon the mast. Against such a sight and against such determination as that of the calmly desperate man who was already accustomed to lead half the people present I might as hopefully have entreated the wind. Master Davy, he said, cheerily grasping me by both hands, if my time is come, tis come. If tant, I'll bide it. Lord above bless you and bless all. Mates, make me ready. I'm a going off. I was swept away, but not unkindly to some distance where the people around me made me stay, urging, as I confusedly perceived, that he was bent on going, with help or without, and that I should endanger the precautions for his safety by troubling those with whom they rested. I don't know what I answered or what they rejoined, but I saw hurry on the beach and men running with ropes from a capstan that was there and penetrating into a circle of figures that hid him from me. Then I saw him standing alone in a seaman's frock and trousers, a rope in his hand or slung to his wrist, another round his body, and several of the best men holding at a little distance to the latter which he laid out himself slack upon the shore at his feet. The wreck even to my unpractised eye was breaking up. I saw that she was parting in the middle and that the life of the solitary man upon the mast hung by a thread. Still he clung to it. He had a singular red cap on, not like a sailor's cap, but of a finer colour. And as the few yielding planks between him and destruction rolled and bulged, and his anticipative death knell rung, he was seen by all of us to wave it. I saw him do it now and thought I was going distracted when his action brought an old remembrance to my mind of a once dear friend. 
Ham watched the sea, standing alone with the silence of suspended breath behind him and the storm before until there was a great retiring wave when with a backward glance at those who held the rope which was made fast round his body he dashed in after it and in a moment was buffeting with the water rising with the hills falling with the valleys lost beneath the foam then drawn again to land then hauled in hastily he was hurt I saw blood on his face from where I stood, but he took no thought of that. He seemed hurriedly to give them some directions for leaving him more free, or so I judged from the motion of his arm, and was gone, as before. And now he made for the wreck, rising with the hills, falling with the valleys, lost beneath the rugged foam, borne in towards the shore, borne on towards the ship, striving hard and valiantly. The distance was nothing, but the power of the sea and wind made the strife deadly. At length, he neared the wreck. He was so near that with one more of his vigorous strokes, he would be clinging to it. When a high, green, vast hillside of water moving on shoreward from beyond the ship, he seemed to leap up into it with a mighty bound, and the ship was gone. Some eddying fragments I saw in the sea, as if a mere cask had been broken in running to the spot where they were hauling in. Consternation was in every face, they drew him to my very feet, insensible, dead. He was carried to the nearest house, and no one preventing me now, I remained near him, busy, while every means of restoration were tried. But he had been beaten to death by the great wave, and his generous heart was stilled forever. As I sat beside the bed when hope was abandoned and all was done, a fisherman who had known me when Emily and I were children and ever since whispered my name at the door. Sir, said he with tears starting to his weather-beaten face, which with his trembling lips was ashy pale, Will you come over yonder? The old remembrance that had been recalled to me was in his look. I asked him, terror-stricken, leaning on the arm he held out to support me. Has a body come ashore? He said, yes. Do I know it? I asked then. He answered nothing but he led me to the shore. And on that part of it where she and I had looked for shells, two children, on that part of it where some lighter fragments of the old boat, blown down last night, had been scattered by the wind, among the ruins of the home he had wronged, I saw him lying with his head upon his arm, as I had often seen him lie at school. Thank you so much for joining me. I will read the next chapter tomorrow. Isn't he an amazing author? I'm so glad we get to read this together. Until I see you all again, please stay very, very well. Good night.